All right. So other than what's going on in the financial space, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has revealed that it loses about 470,000 barrels of oil per day, amounting to $700 million monthly, I beg your pardon. And that's, of course, because of oil theft. The NNPCL says that pipelines, particularly those around Bonnie Terminal, cannot function due to the activities of criminals. Consequently, about 270 bar barrels per day that were supposed to be loaded in Bonnie are no longer going to be loaded because of theft. This explains how Nigeria lost its leading place as the largest producer on the continent, overtaken by Angola and maybe overtaken by Libya. Well, let's get the views of a stakeholder, Mr. Johnson Chiku, who is the managing director of Kauri Asset Management, joining us virtually now from Lagos. Good morning, Mr. Chiku. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Good morning, Ine. Thank you for having me. Great. So how bad is the scenario? We know that uh, the Senate Ad Hoc Committee, I think they left uh, River State a couple of days ago. And then we also have the Presidential Economic Committee, which has that responsibility. I mean, not just about oil theft, but they also have to focus on oil theft. How bad is the situation uh, when we see all of these numbers that are everywhere? Well, if I have to use the word you have asked, I mean, respond directly to the question you asked, I would say it's as bad as uh, it, it, it could be, or uh, it can be, as bad as it can be. Because if you are talking about the fact that we are in the month of August, I mean, July, we only produced 972,000 barrels. And that we have been overtaken by a country like Angola, which produced 1,187,000 barrels a day, and even Libya, that produced uh, 1 million. 123,000 uh, barrels a day. So clearly, that's uh, it's, 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 for me, it's actually worrisome. And again, it's manifesting in every aspect of our economic life. We've seen Naira continue to be under pressure at a period when oil producing countries are smiling to their banks. I mean, I read an article that said uh, Saudi Arabia is thinking of building a new uh, world uh, city where they are going to create an artificial moon uh, because they have made so much from oil. We've seen Angola which should only be the second largest producer of crude, uh, we've seen their currency, their quasa, uh, appreciate from about 620 uh, uh, quasa per dollar to about 400 uh, quasa per dollar, almost 30 percent appreciation. We've seen the strengthening the yield of the uh, Angola Eurobond. But unfortunately, we're not enjoying that benefit. Even Russia that started the war is a beneficiary of the current economic crisis. But conversely, Nigeria is suffering a double whammy. We are not able to produce. We are importing our entire 100 percent consumption, and then we are paying elevated price for imported product we should not be exporting. So clearly, uh, it's manifested in a budget deficit, it's manifesting in subsidy payment in all facets of the general economic life. So help us to understand. I mean, uh, I don't understand, but I would like for you to help us connect it directly, how it's connected to the value of the Naira. Because right now, I think in the parallel market, which is most open to uh, a lot of people, you would buy a dollar for more than 700 Naira. And this is connected to our not being able to meet up with the quota given to us by OPEC. Okay, this is how it works. When you export, uh, your, when you have exports, when your export is higher than your imports, you accumulate what you call foreign reserve. What you earn foreign currencies because it's foreign currencies you use to import goods and services. Um, so as it stands today, when you accumulate uh, foreign currencies because you are of, you only accumulate foreign reserve because you're exporting more products or your export earnings is more than your imports. Uh, your currency, you are you are not able to have more reserve to meet the demand for uh, for your currency or to meet your payment obligations. In that case, what you have is that you have so much resources that you are able to exchange your currency for a lower value. And what, what has happened in the past is that, for instance, a country like ours, our export has declined, and therefore our reserve has declined, and then we need to pay more for imports, and we don't have the money to pay for that import. So when people are demanding for a dollar, you don't have the dollar to give them. And because you don't have the dollar to give them, they are ready to buy the dollar at any price they can get it. It's simple, what they call simple logic of demand and supply. Because you have fewer reserves, more co contrary to the demand for those reserves. 
because you have foreign, fewer dollars, you're using dollars particularly, more less than what people need, the dollar they need from you. So you are rationing. And when you ration, you are able to give a fraction of what somebody needs. And the person is now going elsewhere to look for that additional uh, demand. If you have school fees to pay, let me use a classical example. If your children are schooling overseas and you have to pay for less than $20,000, and you go to Central Bank and you can only get $5,000, but you have a time limit to pay your uh, $20,000, you have to go to the parallel market to look for $15,000. Uh, if you go to the parallel market and you don't have supply of that dollar in that market, you are ready to buy at any price, you can get it. So instead of buying a 430 naira that the Central Bank is selling, you are ready to buy a 700 naira. So the fact is that but if we have more foreign currency reserves, because we're exporting more, if our export increases, if crude oil theft reduces and we begin to export like 2 million barriers a day, 3 million barriers a day, we're going to end so much of foreign currencies that our reserve will build up. When our reserve builds up, we will have so much money to give those who want foreign currency. We will even have more than they need. If we have more than they need, then the price of Naira will increase. Uh, uh, contrary uh, compared to the price of dollar. And therefore, you will see your currency strengthen. So that, try to put in the layman's uh, language, that, that, that's how it works. So your export will determine your reserve. Your reserve will determine the strength of your currency, and which this certainly determines what rate people buy the foreign currencies. Yeah, you, you certainly try to put it in everybody's language there, Mr. Chiku. But, um, so we've seen the federal government, we've seen uh, the Senate ad hoc committee, we have the federal government committee, but conversations going on around this is that oil theft is too sophisticated to be carried out by just anybody. And so, it may be that the people who are in authority actually know what's going on. So what remains to curb this problem is the willpower of those in authority. What do you say to this? I think it's beyond that. That's a little bit simplistic. I'm going to take you through some of the things that we have to address if we have to address your, your ETF. One, the level of poverty in the Niger Delta regions is really very high. So you find, a, and I would like to use an example. You have a pipeline behind your house, and you wake up in the morning, you, have, you have, don't have anything to eat. You wake up in the evening, you have nothing to eat. But somebody tells you, you see that pipeline is carrying crude. And uh, if you can break that pipeline, and you are going to get uh, a barrel of crude, and the barrel of crude goes for um, $100. So your life is miserable. You have no... You're not looking forward to anything tomorrow to live on. So the likelihood that you will, you will withstand that pressure to go and break that pipe is high. But let's assume you withstand the pressure. Are you likely going to take your uh, match to start pursuing a stranger who is breaking that pipeline? Because you have no benefit from that pipeline. So if, you, if the government cannot align the interests of the citizens who live in the oil bearing uh, uh, regions and where the oil pipelines pass with the national interest, they, they have no compelling need to protect the national assets. We must align that, and which is what countries do, by aligning the interests of citizens with the interests of the nation. So that's one factor. Why we need to address the issue of poverty, we need to make sure that those who live in the oil bearing uh, localities have some benefit from the oil that is produced in their location. If you go to those places, you're going to touch poverty. So that's one factor. The second factor is that we have, over time, uh, allowed criminality uh, to get to the point where they begin to influence the societies. And this is basically what has happened. Where, which is the issue of enforcement? Where there is no enforcement, it serves as incentive on its own to, for people to engage in inappropriate behavior or unethical behavior or criminal behavior. So, because what you're doing is you're incentivizing such behaviors. And over time, you're going to have mafias who grow so so wealthy that they will begin to buy or capture the states, which is the level we are getting to, where even uh, naval officers, law enforcement agencies posted in that area are captured. Captured in the sense that they are so much incentivized that they lose their purpose of going to do that uh, to those locations. I, I mean, one of the things that came to the public uh, limelight is that some of the uh, security agencies now lobby to be posted to the Niger Delta regions. Because when they get there, these uh, people that steal the crude can buy them. And they said, I'm protein, providing protection to the nation. They now provide protection to the criminals. Because those guys have become so wealthy 
that the, because the government has failed to take appropriate uh, measures to curtail the activities. Then you have the issues of collaboration between the even the oil companies and uh, and, and, and the oil, oil importers. Because one, you can't explain the fact that oil is being exported out of the country. There is never uh, uh, there's navy around all the coastal areas. But beyond that, people are exporting this crude. How are they exporting the crude that is not captured in our reports? So you have multiplicity of factors. You first have the issue of the level of poverty in the region. Two, you have to improve uh, the alignment, or you must have a share of the heart of the people in that place. They must have an interest in the oil that is produced there. They must feed their Nigerians. They must feed that oil that is produced. They will get some benefit. Their country, their, 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 their localities develop. Their children go to school. They have better environment. So they have a compelling need to protect that asset that is being mined from their locations. And then you have to do issue of enforcement. Those criminals who are involved in this activities must be arrested, must be dealt with. So it, it, it's, it, that's why I said it's a, a whole government of activities that we need to or issues that are involved. Mm. So, so perhaps that is why the PIA uh, has a lot of uh, gives a lot of attention to the host community. Do you see the implementation of the PIA, especially when it has to do with the host community? Do you see it solving, even if it's a degree of this issue with oil theft? Yes, I think there will be some improvement. I mean, uh, judging from what I know, some oil producing local uh, oil producing companies are doing with their engagement with the local, uh, their, their, their um, neighbors or what they call their communities. I, I know of one particular uh, oil producing company that has uh, engaged all the communities where they are, used, they are producing oil, and not just that, they also engage all the communities where uh, their pipelines were passed through. And they make sure that those communities provide protection for the pipelines. And the communities are paid on monthly basis and also get some benefits on the volume of crude that is produced by this company. So, and, and I, I know that the PIA uh, has a provision for host community, uh, and that provision is such that the host community should be direct interest holders in the equities of companies that are producing in their localities or in the value of oil that is mined in those localities. If we uh, work that the details of this uh, very well, we should be able to align the interests of the communities. The truth is that every oil bearing community in the world is among the best, most developed communities uh, elsewhere uh, compared to their neighbors. So the people there should get the benefit. Uh, the community should look very uh, uh, environmentally clean. They should have modern infrastructure facility. The children there, the people from that place should have some level of free medical services, free education, so that they will have a compelling need to protect and encourage uh, mining activities from their localities. I think the PIA would to some extent address that, but it depends on uh, the, 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 the devil is in the details. It depends on how effectively we implement that provision. Yeah. So w looking at uh, this perspective you've given as uh, the proposed solution, you know, to this issue of oil theft, how much faith do you have in this uh, Senate ad hoc committee and the economic committee that the president or the presidency has set up to handle this issue? Well, for me, I think there's enough literature, enough information out there for the government to begin to act. The issue of setting up committees or Senate ad hoc committee or in a, a, a committee of the National Assembly at this point is not necessary. You are in a crisis situation. We should have what we call stopgap measures, uh, one of which I think the government tried to do engage uh, uh, Tom Polo to provide um, security al along the uh, pipelines. But it needs to go beyond that. Every community where the pipelines pass through should have interest in it. If you appoint somebody overall to, uh, to impose himself on all the communities, you're going to have uh, problems on, on that will create its own problems. So I think we need to engage other communities. That's a certain point. I don't think it's a committee issue. We are in a crisis situation. We produce 172,000 barrels a day in July. That is material. That's less than half of our production capacity. And that is going to flush into our uh, international trade report for the second third quarter of this year. It's going to flush into our foreign reserve. It's going to flush into our exchange rates. And it's with obvious overall have multiplicity of impacts across the economy. So we need to take drastic measures. The, we've gone beyond the time when uh, 
it, it, when your fire has some fire, it's not the time when you have to go and think of what kind of, uh, how do you manage fire when it comes. It's time to start fighting with every tool you have. And I think the government should engage the communities immediately beyond engaging just one personality or one uh, individual to spoil the entire uh, pipelines. What should corporates, should, what should they be doing at this time? I do know that, I mean, some IOCs are actually looking for how to get off, you know, get off the platform, unfortunately. But what should corporates be doing in the midst of this? Well, I think I pointed to you us here what one of the corporate, uh, local corporates has done, and they are getting the benefit of that. Uh, when I, I, I spoke with their management, they told me their pipelines are highly breached. And when the pipeline is breached, the community is the one the first to report it, and the community will forfeit the benefit they should get for that period when the pipeline is down. And that has some extent helped them in, uh, in maintaining their production. That's what I expect other oil companies should do. They should have direct engagement with these communities. Um, that's a starting point for me. I like you point, pointed out, the foreign oil, uh, international oil companies are worried and they are all exiting the uh, uh, shallow of onshore assets, I mean, shallow offshore and onshore assets, and leaving that to Nigerians. And that's part of the reasons why we've seen a material decline in our production. Um, they seem not to be able to manage the local relationships. But I think Nigerians should be in a better way to manage the local relationships. Um, and that's why I think uh, I expect Nigerian entities to uh, step in into those uh, assets that are being sold by foreign uh, IOCs. And then in case since we, we, we speak the same language, we know these are our people, we can get to communicate with them, get their concerns, uh, and agree on how to address them. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Johnson Chiku, Managing Director of Calry Asset Limited. We do hope that those corporates are listening and at least they can engage the community more before we see the uh, implementation of the PIA in that area. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. My pleasure. All right. So um, still talking about commodity, but after the break, we will elaborate on another aspect of it. That's here on Business Morning on Channel Television. Do stay with us.